So uh, I'm Nathan Hill and I'm director of the Trinity Center for Asian Studies. And um, it's my uh, great pleasure uh, today for our lunchtime uh, talk to welcome uh, Dr. Chi Zhang. She is assistant professor in the School of Applied Languages and Intercultural Studies at Dublin City University. Uh, she did her BA at Sun Yat-sen University, her MA in Durham, and then a PhD in linguistics from Newcastle and uh, works in Chinese language education, applied linguistics, uh, language attitudes and pedagogy, and um, also the study of Chinese among uh, national minorities of um, uh, China, uh, which is what uh, she'll be talking about today. Her title is uh, Trilingual Education for Ethnic Minorities, Field Studies of the Tujia, the Uyghurs and uh, Inner Mongolia. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for Professor Nathan here to invite me to give this lecture. Um, it is my great honor to you know, share the findings uh, we found from our three field trips. I'm going to talk about the trilingual education for ethnic minorities among three minority groups, the Tujia, Uyghur, and the Mongolian minority groups. So before I talk about our field trips, maybe some background information about that. Shuang Jiao Yu, bilingual education, actually refers to the study of three languages. The first one, Putonghua, secondly, the language of ethnic minorities, and thirdly, English. So the relationship between the three languages is mentioned in the official document, the State Council's decision to further enhance and speed up the reform of minority education. He says the relationship between the minority language and Putonghua should be correctly managed. A foreign language should be offered in regions where favorable conditions exist. The document was phrased in relatively vague terms that neither favorable conditions nor a foreign language was explained. But it can be assumed that foreign language refers in most cases to English. Well, since English was introduced in year three of elementary curriculum back in 2002, English came into the picture of the bilingual education. Therefore, when we talk about bilingual education, Xiaoyu Jiaoyu for ethnic minorities, we are actually talking about trilingual education. In today's lecture, you know, bilingual education and trilingual education will be used interchangeably. Well, well, in the interest of consistency with the official documents, but also reflecting the actual practice. So first of all, Chinese language. The term Chinese language in layman's terms can be complex. It is an umbrella term referring to a standard writing system shared across mainland China with regional vernaculars varying widely. So this kind of wide range wide range uh, variety of spoken forms of Chinese within China can lead to difficulties of mutual intellectuality. Well, Mandarin Chinese is another term we often see in our daily life or in academic writing. It can trace its use back, in, back to the Ming and Qing dynasty. It traditionally refers to the universal standard language or cognate spoken by officials and educated people, and is therefore written as guanhua in Chinese. While nowadays it is usually used to group northern or northern line dialects, namely beifanghua. Another two terms that are often used to translate Chinese language is hanyu, which means towards a particular ethnicity, Han ethnicity, and the other one, Zhongwen, which stresses the you know, Chinese nation, the whole state nation. Therefore, the term Putonghua, which means national common language, is used in the official document. It is standardized based on the variety of Mandarin used in Beijing and the general northern vernacular. It is a variety of Chinese matches the writing system and is the most widely spoken and known Chinese throughout China. Therefore, it serves the function of lingo franco. The term Putonghua emphasizes a statewide standard variety and therefore is intended to sound politically neutral. Well, as you can see from the official document here, the standard national spoken and written language as referred to in this law is Putonghua and the standardized Chinese Han characters. 
but despite not being defined as such in the constitution, Putonghua enjoys de facto status of the official language in China. So the national law, as you can see from the quotation here, Putonghua and the standardized Chinese characters shall be used as the basic language in education and teaching in schools and other excuse of education, except where otherwise provided in law. Putonghua and the standardized Chinese characters shall be taught in schools and other institutions of education by means of the Chinese course. The Chinese textbooks used shall be in conformity with the norms of standard spoken and written Chinese language. So the national law is likely to prioritize the study of Putonghua and suggests that it should be the instructional medium. Now, the ethnic minority language, it is indeed constitutionally protected. As said in the constitution, all ethnicities have the freedom to use and develop their own languages and written scripts. Some of those ethnic minority languages come from different language family. Previous literature has already shown a kind of linguistic hierarchy in China. Putonghua as the official language for administrative purpose nationwide, remains as a prestigious language, whereas the language of ethnic minority is mainly or sometimes exclusively used in family domains and consequently is less prestigious than matter. So the official document uh, issued in 2010, the outline of China's national plan for medium and long-term uh, education reform and development specifies that no effort shall be spared to advance bilingual education and will open Chinese language courses in every school and popularize national common language and writing system. Minority people's right to be educated in native languages shall be respected and ensured. So from this official document, it seems to suggest a balanced bilingualism probably for the purpose of national unity. Well, English on the other hand, well, although the foreign language can be any of six offered in mainland China, including English, Russian, Japanese, German, French, Spanish, the vast majority of students choose English. So since the turn of the century, English has been considered the key to modernity. And there has been great enthusiasm in promoting English language education all over China. English was the third core subject tested in the university entry exam until 2017. Well, since 2017, it is no longer scheduled during the university entry exam period each year, which is 6 to 8 June each year. Well, instead, students can take English exam twice during the year, with the higher scores counted towards the final result. I know there has been some heated discussions in China now, regarding whether we should remove English from the university entry exam or not. But based on my knowledge from the Ministry of Education, uh, English still remains the entry exam. It is still the third core subject for the vast majority, and it is still a prerequisite for university study for the vast majority of students. So today, we will have a look at the code deployment of the three languages, Chinese, Putonghua, the language of ethnic minorities and English across three regions. The three regions are, first of all, Longshan Xian and Yongshan Xian in Xiangxi Autonomous Prefecture, and Wulu Muzi in Xinjiang, and Shifeng in the Inner Mongolia. Here are the maps to show you where those places are. So Xiangxi is located in the Hunan province, while Wulu Muzi in the west of China, and Chifeng in the Inner Mongolia. Well, although it took us well, almost eight hours to drive from Beijing to Chifeng, it is still considered to be you know, close enough to the capital city. So these three minorities were chosen since we think they are a representative sample of Chinese minority groups in terms of, first of all, geographical size and location. Secondly, the degree of integration with Han, and thirdly, the economic development. Well, let's have a look at the geographic size. Xiangxi is the smallest among three, surrounded by regions densely populated by Han Chinese. In the Mongolia, mostly share the external border with Mongolia, 
an internal border with other provinces that have large Han Chinese population. Xinjiang is the largest administrative region in China, borders with three Chinese provinces and eight foreign countries. In terms of the dominant ethnicity, Xiangxi and Inner Mongolia, while the dominant ethnicity is Han Chinese, on the other hand, Xinjiang, the Uyghur group, is the majority there. One of the main uh, similarities among these three areas is that they are all less developed and less urbanized in comparison with Eastern China, especially cities along the East Coast. Well, if we take the per capita disposal income as an example, it ranges between 12,000 to 24,000, less than half of Beijing, the second richest area in China, or Shanghai, the richest. So we will mainly use the government policies, observations, and also interviews from our field trips to examine the code deployment of Tonghua minority language and English with a focus on two aspects, medium of instruction in teaching and also language attitudes. So the first field trip is to Xiangxi. Some background of the Tujia language in Xiangxi, interestingly, there has been a steady increase in the Tujia population in 1990 to 2010, from 5.7 million to 8.4 million. By the way, I'm aware uh, that uh, the seventh national census was completed in 2020, but the statistics in relation to population according to different ethnicities have not been publicized yet. So I'm still using the data back from the sixth national census. Well, against the backdrop of a steady increase in the Tujia population, the northern dialect of Tujia only survives in four countries in Xiangxi, Longshan, Yongshun, Guzhang, so Guzhang, Baoji, and the southern dialect of Tujia is even only spoken by a few hundred speakers in only six or seven villages. So, in this case, the trilingual education policy is, of course, to rescue and preserve the Tujia language. And we can see that from the two governmental notices issued in 2008 and 2010, respectively. 2008 uh, mentions the star of bilingual education pilot scheme. And the interesting thing for the 2010 governmental notice is that it add another competence for their bilingual education, which is to be competent in one of the Tujia arts, while ranging from folk music and drum dance to handmade arts. And the content of bilingual education evaluation was also modified accordingly from merely focusing on the language itself to the inclusion of Tujia cultural activities. So there are elements, but they were relatively limited and selective of Tujia culture. What well, this might be a sign of inching along the way to culturalization, as Ma Rong proposed in 2007. It is about the politicization and shifting towards culturalization. So, our field trip to Longshan and Yongshun Xian, uh, uh, and then we conducted, uh, we visited three schools with. Uh, and conducted interviews with teachers, students, parents, and also we did the class, through, class observations. In terms of the medium of instruction, all our visits to four schools in these two countries show that the medium of instruction is exclusively a variety of Mandarin, Southwest Mandarin, Xinan Guanhua. Well, two main reasons we found from our field trips for the adoption of Xinan Guanhua as the instructional medium. First of all, Chinese is an essential subject tested in the university entry exam, and all other subjects on the exam are tested through Chinese. Instruction in a variety of Chinese increases students' exposure to the standard language in their education and consequently contributes to their performance on the university entry exam. And secondly, it seems to be a compromise to use this language. There were barely any native speakers of the Tujia language among the young generation. 
it seems difficult to use Tuja to teach the Tuja language, especially for the beginner learners. However, if standard Mandarin were used, there will not be any Tuja ambience in the class, was said a teacher in our interview. In this circumstances, the local variety of Mandarin seems to be a compromise between the Tuja language and the standard Putonghua as instructional language medium. In terms of their attitudes, we notice kind of mixed feelings of the Tuja people towards their own language. First of all, they recognize it is their identity marker and they show a kind of sense of solidarity towards it. But at the same time, they tend to associate it with backwardness. A possible explanation might be that the poor economic conditions in Tuja region may lead to a negative perception of anything related to Tuja, including their language. And people may not see any economic value in it. And so they don't see the point to turn their linguistic capital into any economic capital. And also we notice this utilitarian value of Putonghua and English. Well, Putonghua is associated with social economic development and English is associated with modernity and more economic advancement. Therefore, Isu's essence were found for learning both Putonghua and English. So the next field trip was to Wulumuqi in Xinjiang, located in the west of China. So in 2000s, bilingual education was changed in Xinjiang from using the minority language as the medium of instruction with Chinese as a subject course to using Chinese as the medium of instruction alongside the minority language. 2004 actually witnessed the starting point for the rapid development of bilingual education. For example, all courses except for Uyghur language in bilingual classes in Wulmuzi senior high schools should employ Putonghua as the medium of instruction. And following the issue of the outline of the national medium and long-term education reforms and development, the Xinjiang government also produced a local outline of the future chance for education, which is the outline of Xinjiang's plan for medium and long-term education reform and development. In this document, it specifies that bilingual education should extend to two years before schooling by 2012. It should cover at least 85% of preschool, especially age four to five, ethnic minority children by 2015. The implementation of bilingual education should be generally completed in primary and secondary schools by 2015. And this kind of application should cover 75% of ethnic minority students in those two levels by then, by 2020 the coverage of bilingual education should expand to 90% or more of ethnic minority students in primary and secondary schools. And ethnic minority students should be generally fluent in Putonghua by 2020. I would love to see any more update research since 2020 to see if those goals have been achieved. And more specifically, the document even specified a medium of instruction requirement. If Putonghua is said to be the medium of instruction, the usage of Putonghua should not be lower than 85%. In the same sense, if the ethnic minority language is said to be the medium of instruction, its usage in the class should not be lower than 85%. I don't know if there are any language uh, teachers or instructors in our lecture today. Well, with this kind of uh, requirement, well, think about that. What, how, how you're going to implement that if you are teaching a language and also given this requirement. So with all those information in mind, we conducted interviews in one primary school, three secondary schools, and one third level institute with Uyghur students, Uyghur and Han Chinese teachers as school leaders. So first of all, the impact of this trilingual education is that far more teaching hours are scheduled for Chinese class than for Uyghur, while such practice may dilute the study of the Uyghur language. 
Well, English, yes, it still remains in the curriculum, but much fewer class hours are allocated to it. When your students, if they are enrolled in a bilingual class, they need to learn English through Putonghua because it's bilingual class and the video instruction is in Putonghua. So they need to learn English through Putonghua, which may reduce the opportunity to excel in English. Well, in reality, English seems to become a supplementary subject. Now, in terms of their attitudes, all the teachers have already expressed the difficulties to implement the median of instruction requirement. And this kind of concerns were shared among you know, teachers, school leaders, and also students. The ambiguity of this medium of instruction actually made it difficult to, to comprehend for teachers and sub subsequently difficult to implement. Imagine they said that 85% should be in Putonghua, 85% should be in Uyghur. But you know how? What do you mean by 85%? 85% of the classroom time, 85% of what I'm saying, but imagine. If a teacher just keeps saying, follow me, read after me, read this, write that for the whole class, well, probably 100% of the teacher's usage is in the target language, either Putonghua or, or the reader. The teacher does not provide any comprehensible input that is directly towards communicative goals. So it won't have any positive impact on the student's learning experience. So imposing this medium of instruction requirement may not contribute to a positive learning outcome. We know that the Uyghur group is a group clearly show an attachment to a distinct cultural identity. And they are indeed the majority in Xinjiang students immersed in the Uyghur language outside the classroom anyway. So imposing this regulated percentage of medium of instruction may intensify resistance to the national language. But don't forget that this kind of regulated percentage of medium of instruction is not a new invention of the Xinjiang uh, government or, you know, by, or not a new invention by China. The American Council on the Teaching of Foreign Languages, ACTFL, just in case you don't know what ACTFL is, it is the U.S. nation's premier organization for language teaching professionals, providing vision, leadership, and support for quality language teaching and testing, as well as providing support to those who instruct and assess languages. So ACTFL recommends that learning take place through the target language for 90% or more of classroom time except in immersion program models where the target language is used exclusively. This recommendation is also echoed by UPPLI in Ireland. Post-primary language Ireland is a dedicated unit providing expertise and support for foreign language education in Ireland. So in other words, this kind of uh, medium of instruction requirement is, is the widely proposed practice nowadays. Another thing I want to mention here is that both ACTFL and also PPLI provides a list of suggestions to tell uh, language teachers, uh, instructors, how to implement this kind of requirement. I think it would be great if this uh, median of instruction requirement in Xinjiang could also come with a list of concrete suggestions on how to implement it. Now, the third field trip is to Chifeng in the Inner Mongolia. So the Mongolian language in Inner Mongolia, well, first of all, the uh, dominant ethnicity is Han Chinese. Literature has already shown a declining interest in the Mongolian language since 1990s. Well, two main reasons have been identified for this. Firstly, uh, the economic reforms and nationwide marketization contributed to the superior status of uh, Putonghua and English. 
they overwhelmingly dominate in social mobility. Therefore, governmental financial support for Mongolian education was also gradually withdrawn since the education sector was to be managed according to the market forces. So we did a field trip to Chifeng, which is well, just because of the sheer size of the Inner Mongolia, it is unlikely we can travel all the banners or the subdivisions of the Inner Mongolia. We chose Chifeng, one of the 12 subdivisions of the Inner Mongolia. It has the largest population of all cities and banners in the Inner Mongolia. We visit five Mongolian national schools. And based on our field trip, we found a very strong utilitarian value attached to, by like this time, to the Mongolian language. But two possible explanations for this. Firstly, studying it allows Mongol students to benefit from favorable policies such as lower entry mark requirements for university admission. So please note that any student uh, who is identified as uh, Mongolian ethnicity, they are qualified for 10 points extra already for the uh, university entry exam. But that means uh, it doesn't matter whether you are uh, studying the Mongolian language or not, as long as you're ethnic you know, Mongolian, the Mongol, you are, uh, you are entitled to have this extra 10 points. But if you're studying the Mongolian language, you will have a lower entry mark for university admission. And also secondly, the study of this language can contribute due to an enhanced job prospect. The Inner Mongolian government prescribes that 15% of aid vacancies must be allotted to the university graduates who are bilingual in Mongolian and Mandarin Chinese a quota which applies to all public sector courses. Well, however, as soon as the pragmatic value of Mongolian decreases, attitudes towards and motivations for studying the language change accordingly. We can see from the example of the changing weighting of Mongolian in the university entry exam. So the scores of Mongolian and English have been combined and recognized as one subject in the university entry exam since English was introduced in the, in the curriculum in 2003. So the split between Mongolian and English was initially 2A and then 73. The weighting of Mongolian was lower further and the split became 50-50 in 2008. Working hard on English, which is more useful for individual, you know, advancement and also for the future career. So the consequence of this kind of weighting is a significant drop in interest in Mongolian. So comparing the benefits of learning English with the efforts made to study both English and Mongolian, students prefer to devote their attention to English only leading them to devalue the study of Mongolian. And then in 2017, the proportion of Mongolian was brought up with a split of 7-3. But this may not be ideal based on our interviews. One of the interviews is that we would like to see uh, Mongolian to be recognized as a stand-alone subject in the university entry exam. Our field trip to Chifeng in Inner Mongolia was conducted in 2018. So probably motivated by the utilitarian value of the minority language, the median of instruction policies were well practiced in all classes we observed. So Mongolian was the median of instruction during our field trip. In August 2020, the nationally compiled Chinese language textbooks for three subjects language and literature, politics and history was suddenly introduced by the Inner Mongolian government. So the use of Chinese language textbooks for different subjects may indicate that Mongolian language might be replaced by Putonghua in the future as the medium of instruction. So we think that uh, the findings from Tujia and from the Inner Mongolia might be related to this official document. 
the decisions regarding basic education reforms and development issued in 2001. It proposed merging and reducing the number of rural schools to optimize education resources. Therefore, approximately 220,000 rural schools were closed down in 2001 to 2010. With the vast majority of their students enrolled in urban boarding schools. So those Chujia or Mongol uh, children from rural regions or pastoral land lost the opportunity to practice their home language or even just exposure to their home language when they began attending urban boarding schools. So therefore, this kind of urban rural division is likely to aggravate the marginalization of the ethnic minority languages for example, the Tujia and the Mongolian. And secondly, we notice a very strong pragmatic attitude towards the trilingual education. From our field trips, uh, our interviewees show the desire to maximize the benefits of favorable policies, such as the high university admission rates or enhanced job prospects. And that is used as a bargaining tool to navigating the academic practices. For example, to motivate students' learning and to prevent the minority language from being marginalized in local academic competitions among three languages. But of course, uh, I would like to quantify the uh, conversion between the linguistic capital, economic capital, and cultural capital because you know our interviewees and also a lot of those um, ethnic minority students and their parents are using this kind of conversion between different capitals as a bargaining tool to navigate their choices. We also found that the degree of integration with Han may play a role in the median of instruction policy design and also actual practice adopted. For regions with high degree of integration, a kind of laissez faire attitude towards median of instruction is adopted. It is either not specified consequently allowing schools to choose the best learning experience as in the case of Chujia, or you know, the minority language is recommended as in the case of Mongolia. For regions with low degree of integration, a relatively rigid instructional policy is adopted. Well, this is probably based on a mindset of associating proficiency in Putonghua with national unity. However, as I said early on, we see a shift to Chinese language textbooks in the Inner Mongolia. Does this signify that maybe speeding up the learning of Putonghua among minority groups? Well, you probably heard about the discussion in relation to the, you know, the policy review or even policy reform for ethnic minority groups. For Maron in 2007, he calls for the political sization through change such as eliminating minority status and a shift towards culturalization to strengthen national culture identity. On the other hand, two scholars in 2011 proposed a more radical change. They highlight the need for a major policy change suggesting the eradication of the division between the minority and majority as well as the dilution of ethnic consciousness and the encouragement of a shared sense of civil identity. Although this uh, radical change in the current policy is unlikely, what more adjustments or refinements of existing policies may indicate that while the study and uh, uh, the use of Putonghua among you know, minority groups might be on the way. And another question, has been raised as well. We know that a national unity remains the central topic in Chinese education, but whether and to what extent the study of Putonghua can contribute to a unified national identity? So that's another question I think future research uh, can you know, concentrate on. Thank you very much. Uh, I wanna ask you uh, something based on my own experience. You, you mentioned, you, you don't have to study English, right? It, it, there's, you have to study a foreign language and sort of six are available, but almost everyone does English. I was in Inner Mongolia in like 2010 or something. I was in Hohot and found that, that many people studied Japanese. My Chinese is very weak. So I actually spoke Japanese to most of the Mongols that I interacted with. 
Uh, well, and and I said, why are all these Mongols st studying Japanese? And they said, it's because it's easier than English. And then I was just wondering, did you notice any popularity in studying Japanese among Mongols? Well, not based on the visits we did to those uh, Mongol national schools, even including a very rural school in the pastoral land we visit. English is still the foreign language they teach over there. But um, since you mentioned that Japanese is relatively easy from easy to learn. So I, I think that's kind of linked with the comments I got from the teachers saying that they don't have enough resources to teach English. Well, if they, if they think that English in comparison with Japanese probably is slightly more difficult to learn and probably also to teach, more resources are needed. And it is very difficult for them to, for example, use any uh, multimedia uh, resources or um, even connected online to be connected with native English speakers to learn the language. The definition of Han Chinese, I don't know if Nathan has any insights for that. If we can manage to answer that, we probably can come up with a better idea to help with the national unity. It, it is also linked to the uh, debates about what's the best or what's the next ethnic minority policies. Because, you know, if um, we want to emphasize on the nation cohesion and also to build a nation as a one single entity, it is pretty important for us to find a concept that really can uh, make it comprehensible for all people to think that, oh yes, I am X, that X can be, oh yes, I am Chinese, but how do we define Chinese? Like your question, how do we define Han Chinese? If we have a proper definition for that, we probably can have a good answers for a series of questions. So I'm really sorry that I don't have a very short answer for that. So since you invited me to say something here, <laughs> I will. Making a first pass at explaining the situation in China abroad, the, it's easiest to compare to the UK. So in the, in the UK, there's the English and the Welsh and the Cornish and the Scotch and maybe even the Manx. And, and they're all different, um, what would we call them? Ethnic groups is probably what we would call them. Nations even, they do call them in the, in the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, but then there's this, this notion of the British as this sort of uh, overarching category. But it's clear that actually somehow British and English have a special relationship. All sorts of things are clear, like there's no local, there's a local government for Wales, there's a local government for Scotland, there's no local government for England. And the English don't feel like this is unjust because they know they're the majority and they have all the power and all the wealth and whatnot. Um, so so the, it's possible to sort of um, have the distinction British versus English more and less in focus. And then, and then I think partly the confusion is caused by the English language. We, we have the term British and English. We even have the term like uh, Burmese and Burman. We say Burman for the ethnicity and Burmese for the nation, but we don't have this kind of distinction for Chinese, uh, mm -hmm. even though it exists in Chinese. And, and, even, and in terms of ethnicity, in ethnicity there's, this, uh, there's this ethnicity, the Zhonghua uh, Minzu, which is the the, the yeah. nationality yeah. of the whole country yeah, yeah. Uh, and then the, and then the question is how you know how is how is being chinese in the kind of british sense different than chinese in the english sense and i think well we know that, that this is a mess even in, in <clears throat> the uk so it's also um, uh, related to the definition of chinese cinema nowadays when we talk about cinema we have the term chinese language cinema uh, in Chinese language cinema, but um, Chinese cinema is not just Chinese language cinema. So we, we, we yeah, like you said, this messiness just make it impossible to come up with a proper 
um, and clear or more concise kind of definition for it. About Irish education, um, I, I just one thing I noticed when I was preparing for this talk today, I also I, I looked onto the PPLI website and also found the information about medium of instruction. But by the way, when they talk about the medium of instruction, uh, either you know the American one or the PPLI one, they are mainly about uh, the requirement of recommendation for teaching foreign language. In Ireland, when they said this uh, recommendation is for foreign language teaching, mainly French, Spanish, German, well, you name it, uh, Italian, not Irish, definitely not Irish. Irish is not there. But we know in reality, we don't have that many native speakers of Irish anymore. To them, to some of the Irish students, they are, I'm just saying the way they learn it is the same way as learning as, a, as learning a foreign language. And also in one of the uh, uh, questionnaire we did with the secondary students, what well, that question is mainly about the, their study of Chinese. But when we ask them to compare um, their learning experience with their experience of learning other foreign languages, we didn't say what foreign languages is, we just ask them, you know, specify whatever other foreign language. A large number of them include Irish in their answers. This kind of, you know, foreignness of Irish does exist. I'll ask. Um... Uh, I'll ask one uh, question, which is, you mentioned uh, that, you know, that, that being, uh, let's say, having, being classified as a national minority uh, gives you extra points on the Gaokao, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, but then you said also in Inner Mongolia, studying Mongolian can help. English and Mongolian count together, but, but Mongolian sort of counts more in the average. So if you do Mongolian, that's good for you. So the question that I have is, is there a situation like that for the Tuja, like, do, do you do you benefit at all if you study Tuja in on the Gaokao? No, not no. at all. And um, when I, when I said uh, you benefit more on Gaokao if you study the Mongolian language, it means that on top of ten points that every ethnic Mongol could have, and you know there's a, this kind of um, designated quota from each university they can. Uh, they can use. So those quota is for, they can use those quota for those who are studying the, Mongo, uh, the Mongolian language. But for Tujia, I would say um, they could do better. I think uh, hopefully they will, because what, what we found is that they also have a quota to recruit, to recruit uh, uh, Tujia people in the, for the public sector process. However, there's no test for the Tujia language. Mm. It is that it is just that if you are Tujia ethnicity, then you are qualified to apply for that post. But for Inner Mongolia, it's different. They will have interview to examine that you are indeed a fluent speaker of both Tuzhonghua and Mongolian language, so that you can actually you know go for that position. So I think Tujia could do better. And, you know, if they learn from the experience from Inner Mongolia, it would really help to uh, get, uh, how to say, to get um, more, to, to motivate their students to learn Tujia more and help to preserve that language yeah. better. Uh, just a sort of technical follow-up question. This rule that we, you get sort of, if you study Mongol and you get, you get the automatic 10 points for being Mongol, and then you get some extra points for studying Mongolian, is that administrated at the level of the of, of the province of Inner Mongolia, or is that a national like at the province of Mongolia? Oh, okay. It's the Inner Mongolia's policy for oh, that okay. region. So I guess this part of this, you know, being autonomous region, so they have certain autonomy on policies like this. Oh, I see, I see, I see. Because because it it struck me like I don't know like. The Gaokao is this very you know, central yeah. thing, yeah. standardized a, a, a across the whole country. If you let local provinces say, oh, we'll just give people extra points, you know, it could. Oh, it could but, um, uh, it's not extra points, it's the quota from each university. 
they can have certain quota to recruit certain people. Ah, but, uh, but then it only affects universities in Inner Mongolia, right? No, like, no, no. Uh, oh. Across China, but those, you, you know, <laughs> those universities across China will have a specific quota for certain group of people. And for when they recruit students from Inner Mongolia, those quota is set for those who are studying the Mongolian language. Oh, I see, for, I see, I see, I see, I see. So, so, so if we have, if, just to take an example, if you have something like, um, I don't know, Tsinghua University, they might have, okay, we have these many spots for people from Shangxi and these many spots for people from uh, Inner Mongolia or whatnot. And then, so from their perspective, it that's the national, or that's the national policy. It's like, my university has uh, spots allocated according to region. But yeah. from the local region's perspective, they have the ability to kind of, to some extent, affect the rules of how those quotas are applied. Yes, indeed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank super, you so much. Super yeah. interesting. I just want to make a plug. Uh, so I was working with Microsoft recently and made a, a, a auto completion mobile phone keyboard for Tuja. I thought maybe even this, you know, the sense that their language is backward or something. Well, if they can see that their mobile phone uses uh, Tuja, it, it will help. It is yeah. really great that you, you and uh, your colleagues are doing that because uh, I remember when I talked to the um, uh, some of the Tibetan students that they said, well, we're using iPhone only because, you know, this phone provides the uh, Tibetan language input, but not others. So it is great that, you know, you made this software and this app and it is openly available for those users. So uh, thank you very much for this really interesting uh, talk. So let's uh, clap for- uh, Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming.